You're listening to The Jacob Vaux Show. He's breaking down the latest and greatest in sports as only he can. Follow him on Twitter at Real Jacob Vaux. Here he is. Jacob Vaux. Of the Jacob Volk Show. I am Jacob Volk. And take a guess. What am I going to start with? Baseball or football? If you guessed football, you're wrong. I have to start with baseball. Don't worry, I'll get to football, I promise. But I have to talk about the mammoth Fernando Tatis extension. 14 years. $350 million. The third biggest contract in baseball history. Behind just Mike Trout and Mookie Beck. The longest contract in baseball history. Longer than Bryce Harper and Giancarlo Stanton. Now it's kind of funny when it comes to AAV. Tatis's AAV is really just middle of the pack. I understand that's still an obscene amount of money. But in terms of the biggest AAVs in baseball, he's 22nd. He's behind guys like Chris Sale and Paul Goldschmidt. He didn't come close to Garrett Cole. This contract ties Tatis to the Padres through his age 35 season. He is guaranteed to be a Padre throughout his prime. We throw around the term high risk, high reward a lot. Like Corey Kluber, people said, was high risk, high reward. High risk because he has an incredibly long injury history. High reward because this guy is a two-time Cy Young winner. But the reality is, the Kluber deal isn't high risk. It's just for one year. If Kluber blows out his arm in spring training... The Yankees can get rid of him. After this coming season, take care. Thanks for cluttering up our payroll. Have fun somewhere else. Tatis is now tied to the Padres for 14 years. Throughout his 20s and half his 30s. Here's a guy who hasn't even played a full season's worth of games in the majors. In his career, so far, he has played 143 games. That's 19 less than 162. And this guy just got a $340 million contract. What world are we living in? Look, I love A.J. Preller. I think he's done a fantastic job with the Padres. 
I think if any team can beat the Dodgers, it's the Padres. I don't think the Yankees can. I don't think the Braves can. I don't think the Cardinals can. It's the Padres. I've said this before. The NLCS is the true World Series. I love his aggressiveness. Trading for Snell. Trading for Darvish. Trading for Musgrove. Signing Kim. A couple off seasons ago. Signing Machado. But this... This is hard to fully endorse. I know why he did it. All right. If I had to put money on it, I think Fernando Tatis Jr. is going to become one of the best players in baseball. Very fun player to watch. Killed the Cardinals in the wild card round. Got MVP votes last year. I do think he's going to have a great career. But to give him this type of a contract, this early into his baseball career, where are the Padres getting this money from? They're not like the Yankees or the Dodgers where you have this bottomless pit of money. Ron Fowler is a wealthy guy, there's no question. But if Tatis busts, this can hamstring the Padres for years. For over a decade. Injuries happen all the time. Who's to say the Tatis doesn't get a devastating injury and then it's just like a snowball rolling down a hill? It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger until he's never able to recapture his greatness. As great as Tatis is, and he is great, Make no mistake about it. This is without question the riskiest contract in sports history. The only contract that comes anywhere close is Rick DiPietro. But just in terms of sheer dollars, Tatis overtakes DiPietro. DiPietro's was one year longer. Tatis's is for way more money. Now again, I'm not saying Tatis is gonna bust. If you're a Padres fan, you can buy a Tatis jersey and you can wear that to Petco Park for the next 15 years. That's a solid investment. But here's the thing. These big pre-arbitration deals very rarely work out. Sure, you have some success stories. Luis Robert, Eloy Jimenez, Ronald Acuna Jr. There are guys that work out who you sign to big pre-arb deals. But what about a guy like John Singleton, Scott Kingery, Evan White, Matt Moore? Those contracts didn't work. I mean, you're paying a guy in Tatis like he's already a super-duper star in this league. Like he's Trout, or he's Betts, or he's Cole, or he's DeGrom. He's not. He's a great player, but he is a tier below those guys. I mean, really, what you've done is you've destroyed 
the pre-arbitration contract. Let's say Wander Franco or Julio Rodriguez have great rookie years and sophomore years. And the Raisin Mariners want to extend them. They're going to ask for $300 million. Now look, I don't like pre-arb contracts. They're just way too risky. I understand the benefit. You lock the guy up at an incredibly reasonable rate. You have cost certainty on him. I get that. But if I was an owner, I'd have a tough time signing off on it. I'd rather pay a guy a little bit more if I know for a fact that he's earned his money. Tatis wasn't going anywhere. This guy was going to be a free agent in 2025. He had a lot of time left with him. Go through the arbitration process. Then as those values get higher, then sign him to his big boy contract. I'm not begrudging Preller for doing this. If Tatis turns into the player that we all know he can, then to give him 24 mil a year is a steal. Because let's be honest, he would get more than that on the open market. But at this very moment, the deal is just too risky. I have a tough time really getting behind it. I don't begrudge Preller for doing what he did. I like Preller. I like him a lot. But this deal is either going to be a major steal for the Padres or a major albatross for the Padres. I can't endorse that kind of risk. It's tough for me to really get behind this move. On a scale of 0 to 100, 0 being... This is the worst decision in sports history. A hundred being, this is the best decision in sports history. I'm at about a 68. The Padres did make another move, though. And this is a move that's very easy to get behind. It's a move that we knew about before, but we didn't know the exact details of the contract, and that is Mark Melanson, who signed a one-year deal worth $3 million. Mark Melanson has been one of the best relievers in baseball for a while, since 2013. He turned his career around with the Pirates, And he's turned into a really good reliever. I mean, I remember watching him with the Yankees. I liked him with the Yankees. I was sorry to see him go for Lance Berkman. Now, I like that trade. That trade made sense. But to see Melanson go, that was tough. If the Padres had a hole, It was at closer. Because how much can you really trust Drew Pomeranz? How much can you really trust Emilio Pagan? You can trust Melanson. In 2019, he went 5-2 with a 3-6-1 ERA and 12 saves. And in 2020, he went 2-1 with a 2-7-80 ERA and 11 saves. This guy is a really good pitcher. Is he one of the best closers in baseball? Probably not, but he's not going to embarrass himself. 
I don't know how many save opportunities he's going to get with the Padres. Because their wins could be like 9 nothing blowouts. But Melanson does have the ability to get 30 saves. This is a great move for the Padres. It makes a ton of sense. Like I said, Dodgers, Padres, NLCS. And when I say NLCS, I mean whenever they meet in the playoffs. If it's the NLDS, which is very possible, if the Dodgers have the best record in the National League and the Padres win the wild card game, that's the true NLCS. Because I think the Dodgers and the Padres are better than the Braves, Cardinals, Mets, Brewers, Cubs, whatever. I like how the MLB used to do it, where you couldn't face a team in your division until the LCS. Now you can, and I don't like it. It just messes everything up. Because now you're in a situation where the best two teams in the National League could meet in the NLDS. You don't want that. You want that in the NLCS. I guess the better way to say it is, when the Dodgers and Padres meet in the postseason, that's the true World Series. Because whoever wins that series is going to win the whole thing. Moving on now to the Athletics, signing Trevor Rosenthal to a one-year deal worth $11 million. And this really comes out of left field. I had no idea that the Athletics were in on Rosenthal. They just made a bunch of moves to shore up their bullpen. Trading for Adam Kolarik, bringing back Yusmero Petit, signing Sergio Romo. I thought they were done, but now they added Rosenthal? A guy who had a great year last year? An under 2 ERA and 11 saves? The Athletics have the best bullpen in baseball. It's not even close. The Oakland Athletics will win the AL West. As much as I hate them, because I hate Sabermetrics, I hate Billy Bean, I hate what he's done to the game, I have to give the devil his due. You have to think that Rosenthal is going to be their closer. So now you have Diekman and Wendelkin as... The setup guys. And then you have Rosenthal, Petit, Trevino, Weems, and Smith. How are you beating that bullpen? The answer is you're not. The Oakland Athletics are going to win the AL West. Moving on now to the Pirates, signing Tyler Anderson to a one-year deal worth $2.5 million. And I don't mind this move for the Pirates. Anderson's a decent lefty starter. Not great. Not terrible. In 2018, he gave up more home runs than any pitcher in the National League with 30. But he was pitching for the Rockies. He went 7-9 and nine with a 4-5-5 ERA. In 2019, he only pitched in five games. He was hurt. He had a dreadful year. Of course he did. Then last year for the Giants, he went 4-3 and three with a 4-3-7 ERA. The Pirates need a lot of help, but... They really need help with their rotation. Obviously, they just traded Joe Musgrove. Their rotation is really bad. Mitch Keller, as good as he is, he's not an ace. At least at this very moment, he is. And can he turn into an ace? Yes. Is he an ace at this very moment? No. Steven Brault is a good pitcher, but no one's going to be mistaking him for... John Candelaria anytime soon. 
Chad Cool is okay. JT Brubaker really isn't anything special. The Pirates are going to count on Anderson a lot. They did need a second lefty. This move does make sense for them, but my God. They are going to be a dreadful team this coming season. The last baseball story to talk about is the Athletics signing Mitch Moreland to a one-year deal worth 2.25 mil. And this makes perfect sense. I've always liked Mitch Moreland. When he was a Ranger, I really liked him. If he was on any other team but the Red Sox, I would have really liked him. But when he was with the Padres, I was really rooting for him to do well. A, to stick it to the Red Sox, and B, again, I had a strong affinity for him when he was a Ranger. It didn't really work out for the Padres, but Moreland is a solid first baseman. Not great. You can do better than him, but he's not bad. He's not going to embarrass himself out there. I know that the Athletics have Matt Olson, and that's fine. Olson's going to play first, but realize the Athletics traded Chris Davis. They don't have a DH. Mitch Moreland can be that DH. You're not going to move Olsen to DH. In 18 and 19, he was a gold glover. Moreland can be a really good DH. In 2019, he had 252 with 19 homers and 58 RBIs. In 2020, for the Red Sox and Padres, he had 265 with 10 homers and 29 RBIs. Great job by the Athletics in finding a quality DH this far into the offseason. There's no doubt in my mind that they're winning the AL West. I'll reiterate that point. All right, now I'll give you the NFL vault talk. The long-rumored trade of Carson Wentz has happened. He is going to the Colts. In exchange, the Eagles are getting the Colts third rounder this year and a second rounder next year that could turn into their first rounder if Wentz plays 75% of snaps or... 70% of snaps with a playoff appearance. It's also worth breaking down the salary cap implications of this trade. The Eagles will now have $33,820,608 of dead cap on their books for this coming season. They have only saved $852,928. After next year, though, they're free of Wentz's contract. Meanwhile, the Colts are paying Wentz $25.4 mil for this coming season, $22 mil this season after, then they can cut him free and clear if they choose not to. In 2023, he's due 25 mil, and the year after that, he's due 26 mil. I know that this is a politician's answer, But there's no way to properly evaluate this trade now. 
we have no idea what Wentz is going to be going forward. Everyone's pointing to the fact that he's back with Frank Reich now, and Reich was the offensive coordinator when Wentz nearly won MVP. You know who the head coach was? Doug Peterson. Is Reich the right guy to resuscitate Wentz's career? The answer is yes. If anyone can, it's Reich. But to say it's a guarantee that Reich is going to, it's not. And it's not like Wentz was bad with Peterson and without Reich in totality. Last year, he was dreadful. He led the NFL in interceptions, got sacked more than any other quarterback. Abysmal season. There's a reason he was benched for Jalen Hurts. But, In 2018 and 2019, when Peterson was still in Philly and Reich was in Indianapolis, Wentz put up good seasons. In 18, he completed over 69% of his passes for over 3,000 yards, 21 touchdowns to 7 interceptions. He got hurt. Big shocker. He missed the first two games of that season and the last three games. In 2019, though, he stayed healthy, completed 64% of his passes for over 4,000 yards, had 27 touchdowns, and again, only seven interceptions. So to say that Frank Reich is solely responsible for Carson Wentz's success, that's not true. If that was true, then Wentz would have fallen off a cliff in 18 and 19, not just 20. Maybe the league has just figured Carson Wentz out. I don't know. I have no idea. There's no way to properly evaluate this trade right now. I know why the Colts did it. Obviously, Phillip Rivers retired. They needed a quarterback. If they weren't sold on Jacoby Brissett and they weren't sold on Jacob Eason, then yeah, you've got to look outside the organization for a quarterback. And it's kind of funny, they were linked to Sam Darnold, which would have been funny because the Colts traded the third overall pick to the Jets that the Jets ultimately used on Darnold. So talk about coming full circle. The Colts are out now. The Jets are minus a bidder. The real loser here is the Jets. I mean, I thought they could have rolled with Brissett and Eason. But if you want to give Reich a chance to bring Wentz back to being a really good NFL quarterback, I don't mind it. It's risky. It's incredibly risky. But I can't say definitively whether it's going to work out or not. I hate hedging. But unfortunately, that's the only fair thing to do here. As for the Eagles, they did good to get some high picks back for Wentz. At worst, they got two day two picks for him. At best, a first and a third. To get that for a quarterback who led the NFL in interceptions this past year, that's a great job by Howie Roseman. I don't know what this means Darnold is going to be traded for, but... Is Sam Darnold that much worse than Carson Wentz was last year? It's close. It's closer than you'd think. 
I don't know if you can hear the chiming behind me right now. That's because New York is getting pelted with snow. There's nothing I can do about it. I'm sorry. But the point is, I don't think it's crazy to think that the Jets could get two day two picks for Darnold. A first may be pushing it, but two day twos, I think that's possible. And I wouldn't mind it in the slightest. But there is another element to this. Nick Sirianni, the Eagles head coach, I thought he was hired because the Eagles were kind of beholden to Carson Wentz. Yes, you got Wentz off the books for 2022 and beyond, but you still have over $33 million in dead cap for this coming season. You want to tell me that's dead cap anyway because it was a sunk cost with Wentz? I'm not sure how true that is. If your point is that Frank Reich can save Carson Wentz, then you have to expand that to Sirianni, a guy who was Reich's offensive coordinator in Indy. Now, if your point is Wentz is going to fail regardless of where he is, Philly, Indy, wherever, fine. I respect that. But to say he couldn't succeed in Philly with Sirianni, but he's going to succeed in Indy with Reich? No, that doesn't work. But here's the thing. If the point of hiring Sirianni wasn't to make it work with Wentz, why did you hire him? You're telling me he had the best resume You're telling me he had the best interview? I saw Sirianni's introductory press conference. It was not good. And there's no way he had the best resume. Eric Biennemi, Brian Dabo, Matt Eberflus. They're all better. The Eagles did a terrible job with their coaching search. That is one dysfunctional team, Boyo. It wouldn't surprise me if they went 2-14 and 14 next year. Because I am not sold on Jalen Hurts at all. You've got a GM who encouraged you to intentionally lose a nationally televised game. A guy who can't scout wide receivers... Did a terrible job with the O-line. It's going to be tough sledding in Philly next year. I feel for you, Eagles fans. I really do. Speaking of Pennsylvania quarterbacks, there are some rumblings that Ben Roethlisberger may be on the way out. Steelers GM Kevin Colbert really didn't commit to Roethlisberger. He gave probably the most lukewarm endorsement he could. So it's fair to speculate now. Are the Steelers going to move on from Big Ben? I mean, you've got to realize he's going to be 39 On March 2nd, the Steelers did not have a good finish to last year. Forget Big Ben's implosion against the Browns. The Steelers did lose three of their last four. And obviously four of their last five if you count the Browns game. The Steelers are also in cap hell. As it stands right now, they're $30 million over the cap. If they cut Roethlisberger, they'd save 
$19 million. So are they going to cut Roethlisberger? I don't think so. I think Steelers fans would riot. They have no clear successor to him. As much as I think Dwayne Haskins can still turn into Big Ben's successor, there's no way he's there right now. It's not Mason Rudolph. I'd hesitate to give it to a guy like Trey Lance or Kyle Trask or Mac Jones. I just don't see it. I understand the argument for cutting Roethlisberger. I think the Steelers' window to win with Big Ben is closed. I don't think they'll ever be Super Bowl contenders again. And this coming season will probably be Roethlisberger's last. But I just can't see the Steelers cutting him. I can't see them trading him. I think Ben Roethlisberger is going to finish his career as a Steeler. The Steelers may not have a great season, but Roethlisberger will be there to make sure they don't embarrass themselves. Moving on now to the inevitable becoming official, and that is Richard Sherman and the 49ers parting ways. That comes from Chris Bitterman of the Sacramento Bee. I understand why the Niners are going to let him walk. Sherman's going to turn 33 on March 30th. And obviously he was hurt last year. He only played in five games. Now, he was solid in those five games. He had a 67.7 overall grade, according to Pro Football Focus, but an older cornerback, plus only playing in five games, plus no Robert Sala, equals bye-bye Richard Sherman. That's just fact. We knew that was coming. I don't mind the Niners... Letting him go. They're in a good cap situation. They're at just over 13 mil, according to OverTheCap.com. If they want to replace Sherman with a younger corner, a guy like Ronald Darby, William Jackson, or Shaq Griffin, I don't mind that. But I'll say this. A lot of people are saying that Richard Sherman could go to the Jets. Namely because of the Robert Sala connection. And they need corners. There's no question. But there are guys who I would target over Sherman. Darby, Jackson, Griffin... Xavier Rhodes, Jason Verrett, and TJ Carey. The fact that he only played in five games last year, and he's turning 33 in late March, that scares me. Obviously, I wouldn't be upset if Sherman became a Jet. Richard Sherman's probably a future Hall of Famer. And it's certainly possible that he could have a good year with the Jets. There's no question about that, but it is risky. And there are guys ahead of him on my list of corners that I want the Jets to get. If the Jets go into next year with Richard Sherman, a rookie cornerback, Brian Poole, and Javelin Guidry. That's not going to inspire a lot of confidence in me. It won't be awful, but it won't be great. 
The last story to talk about is the Falcons cutting Ricardo Allen and Allen Bailey. Sounds like a before and after from Wheel of Fortune. Ricardo Allen Bailey. Those moves will save the Falcons 10.75 mil in cap room. And it makes sense for the Falcons to get rid of them. Allen Bailey was completely useless last year. He had just a 50.9 overall grade, according to Pro Football Focus. He's really never been that great. Not awful, but you can do better than him. I don't mind the Falcons getting rid of him. Ricardo Allen is tough for me to get behind. Because he is a talented safety. He had a 62.4 overall grade last year. But he did miss some games with an injury. Having said that, though, Keanu Neal is set to be a free agent. How much do you trust DeMonte Kazee and Sherrod Neesman to step up and be the starting safeties for the Falcons next year? I'd have liked for the Falcons... To have tried to find a way to keep Allen. He's been there for a long time, since 2015, and he's a talented safety. The Falcons are in cap hell, there's no question. Even with these moves, they're $20 million over the cap. I know why the Falcons... Did it. I can't kill him for it. But in a perfect world, I'd have liked for them to have found a way to keep Allen. I think he's talented. Until tomorrow, I am Jacob Volk saying that you don't save a pitcher for tomorrow. Tomorrow it may rain.